Thank you for joining us on Heritage Events Live. We're delighted to welcome you to Hong Kong, debating the national security laws impact on business. Please welcome our host, Walter Lohman, Director of the Asian Studies Center at the Heritage Foundation. We hope you enjoy the program. Um, good morning or, or good evening, uh, wherever you may be listening to this. That's the magic of uh, doing this virtually, the, the, the real upside of it. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for, for, for joining us for this discussion of the national security law in Hong Kong and impact that it's having uh, on business. Um, there's a lot of speculation out there about uh, what the impact might be, maybe some wishful thinking. I think those of us who care a lot about um, political freedom in Hong Kong maybe wish it was having uh, some impact. Uh, but, uh, you know, we want to get at the facts here and, uh, and, and, and no spin or wishful thinking. I, re I really hope that we can get an idea of what's happening in the Hong Kong economy, whether there's any um, impact and, and what the impact of the new national security law and really the broader um, national security uh, situation in Hong Kong um, generally. So we want to dig down a little and, and find out what's really going on. And to do that, we brought together two uh, very good friends of the Heritage Foundation, uh, Richard Wong and, and Dennis Kwok. Um, Richard is um, the Philip Wong, Kennedy Wong Professor in Political Economy at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, most importantly, maybe he's a most important from my perspective, he's a long-term, uh, long-standing member of the Asian Studies Center's uh, Advisory Council here at the Heritage Foundation. And he's an old friend of uh, the founder of Heritage and the chairman of that council, uh, Dr. Ed Fulner. So thank you very much, uh, Richard, for joining us. If you could turn on your camera and, and join us. Um, and then Dennis Kwok. Dennis is another very good friend of Heritage, um, of somewhat more recent vintage. Um, we got to know Dennis over his years, as recent years as a LegCo member. He's currently a senior fellow at the Harvard, uh, Kennedy, School, uh, Harvard, Harvard Kennedy School Ash Center, and, uh, and he's a distinguished scholar at, the, at Georgetown University. Um, as you may know, Dennis is also a founding member of the Hong Kong Civic Party. Uh, this is not his first time on a heritage uh, stage, and it's very good to have you back as well, uh, Dennis. So if you could turn on your camera, we can begin the conversation. Well, um, hey, Dennis, good to see you again. And Richard, very good to see you. Um, you know, I wanted to turn first to you, Richard, maybe to help us set the scene just a little bit. You know, I. Um, I went back and watched a program that you did uh, last year, last November, I think, with the Stigler Center at the uh, University of Chicago on the new security law. It wasn't necessarily on the economy. It wasn't mostly on the economy, but you got some questions along those lines. And at that point, your take was that the new security law was not having uh, any impact on the Hong Kong e economy. And I'm just wondering whether anything has changed in the intervening year that would uh, that would change your mind in that regard? Uh, not really. A lot, uh, well, there are a couple, uh, because it's been almost a year, and, and the past year and a half is a, is a period where the world has been gripped in pandemic. So it's very difficult to disentangle uh, what are the factors that are impacting the Hong Kong economy. I think the pandemic has a much bigger impact on the Hong Kong economy in a negative way. Uh, although the economy is rebounding uh, at six, seven percent uh, growth right now, um, I think one can think of the national security law as having a variety of different impacts. What is the direct impact of national security law as a as as a addition to our legal system, uh, and what would that on itself have on business environment? That's one factor. Then the national security law has has a number of indirect and perhaps even more important impact. Uh, first, it has an impact on the political environment, uh, as a result of which, uh, by and large, political opposition to the government uh, will, will die down quite significantly. And that changes uh, the, the, uh, the two other things, right? First of all, it changes uh, the way government behaves and the policy environment. This therefore has an impact uh, on how uh, decisions are made in Hong Kong. The second, which is 
an expansion of what I just earlier said, is that because the, the policy environment in Hong Kong for a very long period of time, since the past 30 years of uh, globalization in the economy, Hong Kong is afflicted with all kinds of problems the Western world has. Rising inequality, runaway home prices, uh, huge concentration of wealth. Now, uh, how would this policy environment, which government in the past 30 years had not been able to address, um, well, not very different from most other uh, parts of the world in the West, uh, how would that change and what would that impact have on the economic environment? And finally, uh, because of the national security law, uh, there will probably China will pro mainland China will have a much uh, uh, economic uh, prospects and it and Hong Kong's economic prospects will probably become more intertwined, particularly as the Greater Bay Area, which is really the uh, the the cities in Guangdong Province, uh, which is you know the southernmost province that is adjacent to Hong Kong and Macau and together with these two cities, uh, how would the business environment interact and what that would have on Hong Kong. So, so there are a number of in, uh, multiple array of factors that are um, uh, associated, uh, some directly and some uh, indirectly with the national security law that that will all have an impact on on the Hong Kong economy. So so this is a uh, this is how I would uh, frame how we would like yeah. to predict Hong Kong's future business environment. All those five. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. That's it's ex extremely com complex, really. I mean, all these different uh, factors and indirect uh, impacts. I wanted to dig down on one with uh, with Dennis that you raised, which was um, impact on the courts. Dennis is a barrister. I think he has some perspective on this uh, because to some extent, of course, uh, rule of law has some impact on, on business certainty and, and will have some knock-on effect to investment. Um, so I just wanted to get Dennis's uh, take on that. What is the status right now? What is the state of, generally speaking, for lack of more precision here, is uh, uh, the state of rule of law in Hong Kong under the, under the new regime? Well, uh, Walter, thank you for uh, organizing and um, moderating this session. Uh, good to see you, uh, Richard. I, I agree with Richard uh, in the sense that um, we are still in the very early days of the implementation of the national security law. It's, already, it's only been in place for one year, but um, we have, of course, already seen profound changes in uh, especially the political and civil society of Hong Kong. And we are um, about to see, I think, um, given that we're in the early days, I, I think we can look back in history. Uh, in 1949, uh, when the Chinese Communist Party took over Shanghai, they reassured the capitalists uh, there that everything is going to be okay. Initially, everything was okay, but we knew um, uh, what happened uh, in history. Uh, and I think we are still in the early days of the national security law. And I think legally, uh, um, we have to try to understand the implications from a broader perspective. I think if you're international business and you're trying to assess the risks that you're facing in this new legal environment, you have to do so holistically and try not to focus on just the narrow aspect of the national security law, i.e. the four criminal offenses created under the NSL. I think you have to look at it more holistically and in a, in a broader fashion. Because the national security law is just one of many, I would say, super aggressive policies that is coming out of Beijing uh, right now. The national security law is one of them. Uh, the anti-sanctions law, which will be applied to Hong Kong, um, uh, maybe sometimes next year, I heard is going to be through local legislation. It's going to have a profound impact on the financial industries and uh, international financial institutions that are operating in Hong Kong. We can dig into that a little bit more as we go along. But many of those policies, perhaps, um, uh, including the crackdown on Chinese technology firms, has a direct or indirect impact 
on um, you know something that we uh, treasure most, which is the international financial status of Hong Kong. Um, the tech crackdown in China is having a direct impact on many uh, potential IPOs and the stock market. So the NSL has to be viewed in um, this wider context, Walter, I think, that um, the NSL um, is one of the many um, uh, very aggressive policies coming out of Beijing. Now, from the legal point of view, I think one of the things that is often uh, overlooked or not really discussed is that the concept of national security is extremely broad, and it is actually not defined uh, under the Hong Kong national security law. The national security concept in a uh, context of PRC laws is actually extremely broad, and it has been actually adopted by uh, Hong Kong government officials um, in broadening the concept of national security. So uh, very quickly, I'll just quote the speech by the chief secretary of the Hong Kong SAR government, which is, of course, number two uh, 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 person in the Hong Kong government, said this in April. He said that the national security it goes beyond political security, territorial security, or military security. It actually encompasses 10 other key aspects, including economic security, cultural security, social security, techno technology security, cyber security, ecological security, resource security, nuclear security, overseas security, space, deep sea, and polar security. I'm, I'm sorry, it's a mouthful, I know, but I'm, <laughs> I'm quoting directly from uh, a blog put out by the chief secretary of the Hong Kong SAR. So I think we need to understand that this is, of course, a paradigm shift for Hong Kong's legal environment. In order to understand what national security en encompasses, you've got to look at speeches uh, and the concepts they use in the mainland to understand the broad scope of national security. And of course, we all know uh, that the national security encompass many, many, many things uh, from financial industry to key infrastructure projects to uh, uh, technology uh, or even culture. Uh, of films can also be involved in national security issues. So I think if I'm an international business, you know, I, I'm looking at all these risks that may potentially apply to my sector, whether I'm in finance or in technology, uh, et cetera. I would be looking at what's happening in the mainland in order to predict what will be the future in, in, yeah. in Hong Kong. Just to, a very recent example, the IPO of DD Chushi. Uh, which um, happened in New York, and it was cracked down by Beijing uh, on the grounds of national security, because data security, as uh, pointed out by President Xi Jinping, is that cybersecurity, without cybersecurity, he said, there can be no national security. And of course, cybersecurity includes data security. And uh, that had a profound impact on a firm like DD Chuxing, which is a huge tech conglomerate. So I think similar trends will uh, uh, probably take place in Hong Kong because um, in order to predict what's going to happen in Hong Kong these days, you know, one should look at what is the norm in China, in mainland China, in order to kind of extrapolate what's going to happen in Hong Kong. I think that's a pretty good trend. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, you know, uh, China obviously is the leading edge of all of this, but uh, some of that discussion of economic security you hear on the floor of the U.S. Senate, too. I mean, it's sort of the wave now away from uh, liberalization, which, in my opinion, is not a, a good thing. But, uh, you know, you raise a good point that I want to ask uh, Richard about, which is, um, had this new situation in Hong Kong, uh, new relationship between Beijing and, and Hong Kong, had it unfolded 20 years ago, the context would be so much different on, on the economic side. But now, uh, to, to, to uh, Dennis's point, um, it's occurring amidst a general, um, uh, really back, I mean, backtracking is not even the right word, but, but let's just say backtracking on liberalization in China, tightening up on uh, big business, especially in the tech sector, tightening up on data, um, and, and these sorts of things. And Hong Kong is becoming closer and more a part of the Chinese system at the very time where it's retrenching economically. Uh, can you comment on that? Well, uh, yes, I'll be happy to. Uh, I think Dennis is making a huge leap. <laughs> What's happening in China and what is 
China's policy regarding Hong Kong needs much careful delineation. China maintains its one country, two system. As far as I can tell, after the national security law has been implemented the, in the past year and two or three months, uh, the, all its focus has been primarily on political opposition activities. Uh, I do not notice any impact on any other sector. Uh, that is uh, uh, an extension of events that is happening in uh, China. For example, China has uh, mandated that young people uh, should not play more than three hours of video games. That has not been applied to Hong Kong. It's not even discussed. It's not even debated. Nobody has aired this or advocated this. So, so one should be, and one can go on with all these examples at infinitum. So that it, it's a huge leap to say what's happening in Hong Kong will also be applied to, I'm oh, sorry, what's happening in China and will be applied to Hong Kong. I don't really see what is happening. It's, it, that's that's a wrong inference. That's illogical. Um, based on what we have seen in the evidence today. And he starts with talking about Shanghai in 1949. That, that's, that's a very different part of history. That is a reasoning by stretch. Uh, the other thing I'd, I'd like to, to come back to is um, uh, in terms of uh, the question of, uh, so I don't see that, but yes, the politics is. Uh, but, but that is a period of going through through literally seven months of nonstop rioting and violence on the streets, right? That is a very difficult time period, and this has stopped. And so, 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 one can always debate uh, uh, what would have happened, but, but the the consequence so far is that I do not see any direct impact on the economy. Talking about the anti-sanctions law, is that? Yes, if the Chinese anti-sanctions law were to be applied to Hong Kong, uh, it would, it could possibly have an impact on financial uh, business. But what has happened is that China mainland in Beijing has agreed that they would not extend the anti-sanctions law to Hong Kong, but rather that Hong Kong would legislate its own. This, as far as I can say, has been Hong Kong's appeal to Beijing to ask that this should not be extended to Hong Kong, but rather that Hong Kong should do that. Now, this is uh, the beauty of a common law system in Hong Kong. Right? Professor Andre Schleifer at Harvard University is the, is the author of The Legal Origins Theory. And, and and if one look at all his work and the work of his colleagues tells us, once you have a legal system in place, right, uh, it tends to have persistent influence on lifestyle and on, on civic, cultural, economic, including even some political dimensions of activity, not for years, but for centuries, right? That's his work. And therefore I feel that um, the system in Hong Kong, uh, recognizing that the anti-sanctions law uh, could have a potential challenge for Hong Kong remaining as, a, uh, as an international business and financial center, then it would be possible to appeal to Beijing that this law cannot be directly applied to Hong Kong, and that is. But but, uh, but, but let me ask you if I can just interrupt you for a second, Richard. Uh, but but isn't that where we started out with the uh, extradition law and with the national security law? Was Beijing asking Hong Kong to do it? So now the the, the point on the anti-sanction law, if it, it's a re, it's basically an offer you can't refuse. Okay, enact this law, and we have changed the the composition of the LegCo to make it easier. And if you don't in, if you don't enact it, we will enact it. I mean, they don't have to say that; it's already proven. No, the the twenty the well for for the national security law, Hong Kong was under constitutional obligation to enact it. And, Not and for a long time, right? but for a long time, right? <laughs> yeah, a lot of things time, don't happen forever, but, right? But political opposition prevented it from being legislated, and therefore, for for basically for 
for 24 years, there was no national security law. When the basic law agreement, the agreement between uh, Beijing uh, had obliged Hong Kong's legislative council and government to enact that law. So you protect it, protect it. We failed to deliver on that promise on mm -hmm. one side. Now, this anti-sanctions law uh, was adopted in, in Beijing for, uh, for China. Uh, and it was considered to be extended to Hong Kong. Uh, and I think, uh, well, the, the, it, it will come down to when it does get adopted in Hong Kong through Hong Kong's legal system with, with uh, its own courts. And at the moment, uh, even our court of final appeal have independent uh, foreign uh, judges on, the, on, on its board and they have continued to stay on. Uh, the question is that what would that law look like? And I think it's still too early to know what that law looks at and how that law would be implemented. Obviously, if you have an anti-sanctions law, it will have very little impact, but it will be a headache to administer. As even in Hong Kong, right, many investment banks would not take clients who are US citizens because of all those sanctions laws that make, make business so costly to do. Right, so uh, you go to many banks in Hong Kong, investment banks, they don't want business that are American citizens because of compliance. Right. Now, right, the, right. These sanctions will be, will be attached to a very small number of people, most right, likely. Right. And yet, yeah, we, compliance yeah. costs so high. And that's the problem. Yeah. Right, right. And we, we already did that to ourselves so, with the FATCA. Not so much the economic impact of anti -Zan. What impact does it have if our chief executive is sanctioned on Hong Kong? Right. But if you have an anti-sanctions, and then for uh, and banks would have to decide whether they they stand mm -hmm. on U.S. law or Chinese law. Wow, that's it. But then you're still dealing with you know maybe a few hundred, a few thousand people who are sanctioned, right? But the compliance right. cost is huge. Yeah, I do agree. It's it's a headache to administer. Okay. As, uh, so these are some of the issues. And so at the end is what would the content of that law look like? And and I think at the moment we don't know. Okay, okay. Let me let me let Dennis. Uh, there's a lot to reply to uh, there, so I'll let you. Uh, let you... Um, I, I I think uh, first of all uh, I want to comment on uh, the status of one country, two systems. In 1997 we had a handover. In 2020 we had the takeover by uh, the Communist Party of China. And I think it is delusional. For anyone to say that one country, two system is fine, it is all hunky dory. It is uh, 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 as you know originally intended. Everything is fine. No, I mean anyone with um, uh, honest observation of what's going on in Hong Kong would say to you that one country, two system is just a fallacy. It is not uh, working, and or to put it a uh, 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 straightforward way, it is no longer in existence. And I think that's a fair comment to make, judging from uh, uh, the recent events coming out of Hong Kong. You're right, Richard. History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Um, you know, I think looking at it is important to look at uh, what's happening in Hong Kong in the historical perspective of um, the kind of actions and policies that come out of uh, the Central People's Government and the Communist Party. And I think you can't sort of take Hong Kong out of that context and look at Hong Kong sort of in isolation. I think that's very dangerous, especially for international business. As I said, you need to look at the situ situation holistically. And I've said on many occasions, what's happening to Hong Kong is not an isolated incident. It is actually part of the grander national policies that are coming out of uh, Beijing, whether it is Xinjiang, South China Sea, Taiwan, the trade war with US, sanctions, uh, uh, anti-sanctions law, uh, wh whether it is uh, a trade war with Australia uh, and the aggressive stance towards Taiwan. I think this is all part of uh, 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 the national policies that is coming out of uh, Hong, uh, 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 Beijing. And of course, it will have an impact on Hong Kong. Hong Kong is now firmly in the orbit of uh, the Central People's Government, which is different from before. Uh, I would say that before 2020, before we had to take over, um, Hong Kong uh, were some degrees still separated from uh, uh, China in terms of its uh, a one country, two system model. But now that it is firmly within the model, uh, within the orbit of the Central People's Government, all the policies happening in China will have a direct impact on uh, Hong Kong. 
um, you know, you say there's been no impact on economic activities. The Ant Financial IPO was canceled what, a week before it was supposed to take place because of what's happening in China. You know, and more and more IPOs we're hearing are canceled or postponed because of the technological uh, policies, uh, the tech policies in, in China. So that's one example of how it has a direct impact on the Hong Kong stock market. And you talk what? about anti-sanctions law. Hang on, Richard. You talk about the anti-sanctions law. Let me just explain to the audience that are not familiar with uh, what's happening with the anti-sanctions law. The anti-sanctions law. Uh, Richard, just hold on one second because we can't hear you. So then it's finished, and then you, and then take a shot. I'll be I'll be quick, Richard. Don't don't worry. Be patient. Um, uh, oh, I you know, with, with, with the anti-sanctions law, what's happening is that China is basically forcing uh, players in the financial markets, especially, to take a side. Whether you if you follow U.S. sanctions, you will be breaching laws of the PRC and very soon the laws of Hong Kong. True, we have not yet seen the exact draft of the legislation, but as Walter pointed out, I think the order has been made by the Central People's Government. We expect you to do this. You don't want us to do it, then you do it ourselves. Do you th I don't think the Hong Kong government has much room to maneuver in terms of how they want to apply uh, this anti-sanctions law, because the spirit of it is that either you follow the Chinese regime or you follow the U.S. regime. If you fo follow the U.S. regime, then you will have serious legal liability operating in Hong Kong. So if I'm a U.S. investment bank or a Western investment bank or a, a, a retail bank, I will have to ask myself, how can my operations operate in accordance with U.S. Uh, 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 sanctions law, but not in accordance with the Chinese regime when this anti-sanctions law is applied to Hong Kong. That's another example where this is having a direct and profound impact. I think we're kidding ourselves to say that, oh, it's not going to be, it's just going to be a, a little bit of um, uh, 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 regulatory uh, trouble or obstacle of doing business in Hong Kong. I think you are doing Hong Kong and the international community a disservice if you are underplaying the risks that will be uh, generated by uh, the anti-sanctions law being applied to Hong Kong. Richard, fire away. If one were to get Dennis' logic to go through, then why bother even doing business in China? <laughs> uh, why are investment banks in, in, in the U.S. Uh, uh, upping their investments in China? Right? By your logic, uh, you don't even need to go to Hong Kong. You don't even need to go to yeah. Why even bother to China? Why don't we completely decouple from China? Well, the answer is very simple. It is going to be extremely costly for everyone in the world to do that. So costly that you wouldn't even be able to, to fathom the cost for all of, uh, not, not just US and China or Hong Kong, but for the whole world, right? If, uh, if, if Dennis' uh, suggestion is correct, all right, the, uh, you know, why, why bother, right? Uh, why don't we just decouple completely? Right? And the answer is, obviously, that is not really going to, one has to ponder whether that is a worthwhile uh, uh, step to take. And, and furthermore, uh, what is happening to China, let me just restate, in terms of the policies they are enacting, uh, now I don't want to, to, uh, to, to go into huge discourse about why they are doing it, but <laughs> with Without national security law, would that make any, any different? Uh, what they are doing? That I don't think they are doing all these policies in China with whether it's on and financial, what because we have national security law. It's, it's, but national security has no impact. Even without national security law, even without the social protests in 2019, China would have gone on to 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 deal with these uh, these uh, tech technology companies and so forth. Uh, so, so I, I, I would be very skeptical of any of this. Any of this has to do with national security law as such. What I think is that, we, what I, going back to what I was saying is that uh, much earlier at the start is that the future, whether Hong Kong remains a business hub does not depend only on national security law. There are many things that are going on in the economy. Perhaps um, one of the most important is that how does US-China relations develop? That might have a, an extremely important impact uh, on the future business environment in Hong Kong. This 
will, national security is not going to have any impact on this, other than in media debates and 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 uh, uh, discussions, right? Um, national security law in Hong Kong is just a tail that you know doesn't whack the dog, right? Uh, the other things that will happen is that China's economic policies in the Greater Bay Area, uh, uh, a an area that 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 is. Uh, 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 as I mentioned earlier, and and because as U.S.-China relations uh, 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 play out, will have a huge impact, I think, on how this region develops in the longer term future. The objective of this, of the the economic policy there, is to leverage on the different comparative advantages of different cities in the region so that they could achieve greater uh, complementarity that will spur the growth of the uh, whole region, uh, including Hong Kong. Now, this means a, a, a transformation of the Hong Kong economy to, to some degree, and so that our, our reliance exclusively on finance and property sectors uh, will become more diversified. And as it become more diversified, finance and property actually will uh, will benefit from it because there will be more economic opportunity. Now, how does those factors will become quite important in creating uh, the uh, uh, impacting the future of the Hong Kong economy, regardless of national security law. Uh, and as long as the proposition remains, that the world would like to do business with China, the, including the United States want, would like to do business in China, uh, then I think there will be a role for Hong Kong business to grow and diversify. Uh, no doubt national security law will alter some behavior. Uh, at the moment, it looks like it's highly targeted at, at political dissent, political uh, opposition uh, uh, at this point moment in time, uh, we'll see whether it will expand to the other. I think it's too early to predict, too early to know. Uh, in, uh, if we were to end up in a scenario that the world is going to decouple from China, then of course, you know. Um, uh, but, you but know I don't that, think um, that, 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 a different story altogether, right? So right, right. Be, it's a different discussion. Right, but, but um, I, 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 I let me just frame this maybe to, to, to turn it over to, to Dennis, but I, I don't think that that's the, uh, that's really where it's headed. And that's not what I think anyone is suggesting that there should be a decoupling. Um, um, and, and therefore, you know, a lot of these concerns are, are unfounded, but I think you do make a good point about the continued foreign investment interest in China and Hong Kong. And um, and so it makes me, uh, you know, it raises this question for Dennis, which is, is that an important distinction to make? That that uh, you know, it's one issue the way the Chinese government, the Communist Party, is now treating Chinese businesses. Okay, I mean, there's just no question there. There's a trend towards increased control. Uh, a move away from liberalization, and it is it has been continuing now for a decade, but it has intensified greatly in the in the last few months. But that's involving Chinese companies. At the same time, they're actually letting in more American companies in autos and 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 in, uh, in finance and some other things. Uh, so is so does that dichotomy also play out in Hong Kong? Is there a difference the way we should see Hong Kong companies, Chinese companies, and the way that they're being treated? in Hong Kong under the law and the way that foreign companies are treated, should those two, should foreign companies see their prospects differently than the way China is treating its own companies and, and the way that it's encouraging Hong Kong to treat companies? Yeah, I think, Walter, you, you, you bring up an important point, uh, which is that I think doing business in China um, and doing business in Hong Kong used to have a degree of separation. Um, but I think doing business in Hong Kong states, you are increasingly looking at the same set of environment as doing business in China. And um, Richard said, well, you know, all the Wall Street banks are still going into China. Yes, they are. Of course they will. Um, they will continue to do it as long as they can make money out of it. 
Um, and you know that's what banks and uh, uh, commercial entities will do is if there is a profit to be made, they will assess the risks against the profits uh, and um, they will go into a market if they can make money. Now, but what I'm saying is that um, I think it is wrong to say that doing business in Hong Kong these days under the new uh, legal and political environment is the same as uh, 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 before 2020. I think that's uh, number one, delusional. And second, you are downplaying um, the many uh, uh, policies that are coming out of uh, Beijing that has a direct impact uh, on, on many aspects of Hong Kong society, including economic and commercial operations, because it is very hard to, uh, as you said, decouple. I think a complete decoupling is uh, almost impossible, given how intertwined the economies are, not just the US-China economy, but uh, globally. But I think um, Hong Kong is interesting as a case study because it is being pulled away from uh, uh, one system, the international system, and being sucked into the orbit of uh, the, uh, the Chinese system. And you mentioned the Greater Bay Area many times. You know, when I was a lawmaker, we were invited to go and talk to officials in the mainland, and we did tours of, you know, the Greater Bay Area. Basically, you know, the, the, the message I, I got from the officials that I spoke to is basically they want Hong Kong to be further integrated into the Greater Bay Area. Uh, you know, that is really uh, 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 the policy behind the GBA. And if that is the case, do you think Hong Kong will not be further pulled into uh, uh, the China mainland system as we go along? Um, and if that is the case, then businesses uh, and the international community need to understand the kind of environment they are going into is not going to be the same as the one they, they knew before. So that's the point that I think is uh, it's important to get out, Walter. Yeah. Uh, no, please, uh, Richard. Uh, there's no point in saying whether the time up before NSL and after NSL, are they different? Of course they are different. The only question is how different? In what ways is the business environment altered? And can business navigate those risks? And how costly are those risks, right? Um, it's not a zero one, it's whether it's a 0 0.001, 0 to 0 0.1, or, or what, right? So that's the key. And, and first of all, there is no evidence uh, that it is a zero one. Greater integration with uh, the greater Bay Area seems to, to conjure up that we are going to Hong Kong, the city of Hong Kong is going to be uh, sucked into a mainland system. But integration means uh, mutual influence, right? Mutual influence. On, in political ground, on, in politics, a small country and uh, sorry, a, a small yeah, a small country integrating a big country gets absorbed. In economics, that's not the case. That's not how markets work, right? Um, uh, it's really about productivity, about innovation, about creativity, and ultimately uh, how the legal courts are going to adjudicate on on economic business transactions according to the rule of law so that arbitration judgments and courts are going to be fair and just and transparent based on those it is not obvious to me that uh, uh, the courts and the and the judiciary system uh, on all these matters uh, are going have any evidence they have changed now one can say because China's policies are changing, but, but that doesn't mean that China policies changing will impact our legal systems in these areas, which really matters a great deal in terms of international business. International businesses work in many environments uh, and they are able to navigate the risks. Now, uh, I think doing business with the United States was much easier 30 years ago than it is today in international business because of, ever since 9-11 has been a lot more difficult to do a lot of business transactions, right? So the whole world's and business environment is altered. So, so far, um, I would generally find very, when one, it is easy to say that I have belief systems and I think if A happens, so would B and then all the way to Z. Uh, as, as a empirical 
uh, economists, I would say, let's look at it as it uh, as the evidence become either more and more uh, transparent, uh, uh, evident where it is going. At the moment, I don't see very much. Yet. And I'll go back to what Walter said. Uh, do I have any reason to believe uh, my my views about the impact of national security on the economy is that I don't see, uh, even at this change, that I would have changed my views over the previous year. Uh, now, this is not to say that uh, uh, political dissent has not been uh, uh, restrained and uh, probably uh, muted, right? That is that is uh, certainly the case. But changing the political dissent uh, may it may also create an environment that many economic policies that should long have been integrated implemented in Hong Kong to correct uh, uh, the failures of adjustment in the past uh, 20 to 30 years of globalization that has impacted Hong Kong, uh, make life for the middle class much more, more uh, uh, difficult, less, less uh, upwardly mobile. Some of these policies may well be uh, adopted with greater ease today. So there will be less gridlock uh, uh, in the political arena. Now, I'm not saying this will definitely happen, but it certainly opens up an opportunity which the window of which was not really present in the past. And, and if these things happen, then the, the social and economic environment in Hong Kong may actually get better uh, in addition to its relationship with, uh, with China. So I think the judgment is really out and it would depend a great deal on what would happen in the next four or five years uh, uh, in, in, the, in the policy environment area. And, and if society becomes less divided economically, uh, I think um, uh, this cannot be something that is bad for economic growth. Uh, it will allow our, our young people, our middle class people, our, uh, to be able to take advantage of newer economic opportunities. Uh, one of the real sad developments in Hong Kong in the last uh, 20 to 30 years has been economic opportunities have not grown. And this is a problem that faces many societies uh, going through this globalization. Uh, and one of the consequences have, have led to greater political divisiveness. So I am, uh, my, my own view is that I don't see a lot of evidence that um, the business environment is uh, damage in any mortal way. National security law has <laughs> altered some of the risks, but, but to the extent they are primarily located in politics, uh, then the business environment has, will not be hurt. Fundamentally, uh, Hong Kong has a very long tradition of being a free market, a, a rule of law, common law, jurisdiction, I think these institutions will be quite robust. They might be subject to some stress, sure. but, but not a whole lot. Here, let, let me let uh, Dennis get in here. The, um, uh, to, to, you know, the, one, one of the great things about this conversation is that it's really pitting the mind of a barrister against the mind of an economist. So you, you guys think in different ways, I think. Um, uh, but I, but I think it's fair to ask you, Dennis, um, your response to sort of this empirical question, which, you know, that's what economy boils down to. How is the economy doing? Can you actually see the impact in the current, uh, in the current numbers? Um, and if not, why not? And, and, and how do you explain that? Yeah, Walter, I, I, I just want to jump in on the legal system and the rule of law point because uh, Professor Wong yeah, has said that the legal system hasn't really changed and then the rule of law is still in Hong Kong. You know, I, I have my serious reservations about those observations. Um, first of all, the devil is in the details. You need to look at the national security law in its details. And 
uh, based on my legal analysis, and if you read, for example, Article 47 of the National Security Law, it actually gives the power to the chief executive to certify certain matters to be of national security. We don't know what those matters are. It is completely within the discretion of the chief executive to certify. I say this matter is a matter of national security. And that certification, Walter, is binding on the courts. The courts cannot adjudicate on whether the chief executive was right in exercising her discretion. Uh, it is binding on the courts. And you can't use the basic law to challenge the national security law. The Court of Final Appeal has already said that in the Jimmy Lai case, that you cannot challenge the national security law on the basis that it contravenes the basic law. So the constitutional structure of one country, two system has been completely ruptured by the NSL. And the NSL, the detail, you look at it, it actually doesn't grant jurisdiction to the Hong Kong courts to deal with issues of national security on their own, except certain criminal cases. It actually doesn't confer jurisdiction on the Hong Kong courts. And with provisions like Article 47 of the Basic Law, you are basically creating a system whereby the chief executive, together with the National Security Committee in Hong Kong, can make decisions that are binding on the courts and there's nothing anyone can do about that. And the decisions of the National Security Committee are not subject to judicial review, which is a very, you know, one of the central tenets of the rule of law is that the decisions and powers of executive authorities are reviewable by a court of law. And that has is no longer the case in Hong Kong today because the decisions coming out of the CE or the National Security Committee are not subject to judicial review. Now, of course, um, people would say, oh, but the national security only covers the four offenses. But as I, as I pointed out at the beginning of this talk, the concept of national security is extremely broad. It covers everything from the key economic sectors to polar security, whatever that means, space and polar security to economic security to uh, cyber security. And that kind of policy is being adopted by the Hong Kong government, not the mainland official only, but the Hong Kong government um, chief secretary came out and say that this is the concept of national security. So I think we need to tell the international business and the community out there that national security has a broad impact. Now, I agree with one point uh, Richard made is that we're still in the very early days of the national security law. And I think um, if you look at the economy, if you look at the empirical evidence, Walter, I agree that we are still in the very early days and there's COVID, there's the lockdown, there's the quarantine measures that has a severe impact on economic activities, not just in Hong Kong, but in the overall uh, uh, Asia region. But I think um, we, need, we shouldn't be downplaying the legal risk that has been generated as a result of the NSL and that um, the legal system, if I'm advising a client I would tell them that the legal system in Hong Kong has been fundamentally changed as a result of the NSL. And it is not just looking at the four criminal offenses. And to think that if I just stay away from, from politics, then everything will be a uh, 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 fine. That is an illusion. And finally, I'd just like to say, simply by locking people up in jail, Richard, is not gonna create harmony. It's not gonna create a less divided society. In fact, you are creating an even more divisive society. It's just that the problems are buried or the dissents are buried under the rock or you lock all the dissenters into jail. It's not going to create harmony. It's actually going to create an even more divisive society. But I think that's a conversation for another occasion. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, what's happening here in the biggest uh, picture is that, um, and maybe both of you could agree with this, is that the value proposition at the very least is changing uh, with Hong Kong. And it's becoming something different. Now, you know, you can attach a, a moral judgment to that. I do. Uh, or you may not. But the, but, the, but the proposition is changing. And it's not, and, and sort of in an empirical sense, it's not necessarily changing bad or changing good, but it's changing, right? And so that's what we're going to see play out, I think, over over the next years to come, whether that remains an attractive model, whether Hong Kong as a, a, a more integrated part of uh, China, more integrated into the greater Bay Area, more a part of that value proposition, more subject to uh, trends 
even more sensitive to uh, uh, to economic trends in China than it used to be. Whether that continues as as something that's viable is the question. Um, you know, this has been a terrific. Yeah, yeah go ahead. One very simple point. You say it's yeah. very easy to, uh, but it's a fallacy to think that as we become more integrated, say with Guangdong Province and Greater Bay Area, that means Hong Kong is doing business with Greater Bay Area, which is a closed economy. It is not. The Greater Bay Area is a major export country. Uh, sorry, export province, right? Uh, and as we become more integrated with Greater Bay Area, we are actually becoming more integrated with the rest of the world as well, right? Because that's how markets work. It's not geography. Yeah. It's not. It's but, not. Well, you're becoming more integrated. You're becoming integrated in a different way. Hong Kong has always been integrated into yeah. global markets. Right. It's becoming it's integrated right. in a different way, which is more China dependent. You will acknowledge that, right? It, it, the new well, model even, will be more dependent on China. But if we become integrated with, 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 with the Guangdong province, we are integrating them more and integrating the Guangdong province with the rest of the world, right? That is very crucial because most of the things that are produced in the Guangdong province is so overseas, right? So the more we integrate it, we are making Greater Bay Area, um, uh, Guangdong province and Hong Kong become much more integrated with the rest of the world, right? Um, maybe Southeast Asia, East Asia, right. uh, and so you are you are integrating. You see, markets work by greater uh, um, intermeshing of networks, right? Now, uh, this is 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 is, is important uh, to to appreciate, right? It's it's not a it's not like uh, you know geographies and 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 politics, right? Now. Right. It, so doing, uh, uh, I, I would anticipate that the Hong Kong economy going forward in the next 10 years, all right, uh, will look, uh, will have industries that will look quite different from the industries we have uh, in the past 20. This is not to say property and finance is going to go down. They will actually rise, but then we will have a much greater. You see, at the moment, Hong Kong for, you know, the past 15 years have been very dependent on tourism. I think tourism is going to decline uh, in Hong Kong uh, post COVID and all that, and Hong Kong would have to reinvent itself. Uh, before before the Korean War, Hong Kong was a uh, uh, re-export center, you know, it's an entrepot. And the Korean War, which uh, wiped out Hong Kong's entry board business for 10 years, completely, completely wiped it out. Then Hong Kong reinvented itself as a manufacturing sector. So what I'm saying is, if you look at the economic side, it's changing. Now, in terms of value proposition, Walter, what you're saying is, hey, you know, the moral judgment, the political judgment, well, you know, that's another subject. Uh, but, but the economic uh, uh, proposition is that uh, I do not, necess do not at all see that uh, the, uh, the, the long, um, you know, ten, in 10 years time, Hong mm -hmm. Kong's economy uh, is actually going to grow go smaller. I think it will grow right. significantly bigger. Uh, but I think we're, we've got to wrap it up here, but I want to, because uh, Richard, you led off here uh, at the beginning, I want to let Dennis uh, close, give us his last uh, 90 seconds or so uh, comment. Well, um, um, I, I, I think we got to look at um, Hong Kong uh, holistically in the sense that, um, as I said at the beginning, Hong Kong is not uh, uh, an isolated incident um, in the China story today. Everything is happening in China uh, is happening very fast, uh, especially in the last few months. We're ha we're seeing big uh, policy changes coming out of China. You know uh, whether it is the crackdown on the techno uh, tech sector, uh, you know uh, on the private education, on you know gaming, or uh, a common prosperity uh, that is now being championed by Xi Jinping. Uh, you know, um, uh, maybe we're looking at a third wave of uh, economic redistribution. Um, you know, all those policies, um, uh, whether it is uh, including national security law or anti-sanctions law, I think all of them will have an impact on Hong Kong. Um, and more so than before, what I'm trying to say is that Hong Kong today is very different from uh, Hong Kong before 2020. And Hong Kong today, it is much more uh, susceptible uh, to influence and changes in mainland China. So I think um, to, to look at Hong Kong today, 
you've got to look at the what's happening with the rest of mainland China. And as there are to be more control, more aggressive policies coming out of Beijing, Hong Kong will certainly be impact on. Thank you. Well, thank you all for this this conversation. It was everything I expected and hoped that it would be. It was a very, very productive, uh, lively discussion. Thank you for the time. And I'll be seeing both of you, I'm sure, virtually, if not in person, in, in the relatively near future. Thanks.